think I come across as a very, very unlikely candidate to be involved in conservation. Um, first of all, being from a different background. It is something that I've had an interest in for, for quite a while. And over the years it snowballed. And currently I run an organization that looks to partner with like-minded people and work towards a common goal in you know, finding solutions for, for wildlife crime, especially focused on endangered animals. But you know, more closely to home, rhinos has been the issue. And it sounds like we it sounds like we're hammering on the same thing on and on. But it's an actual fact. I mean, rhino horn is still a high demand. Yeah. I mean it's the price of rhino horn on the black market is higher than cocaine and gold. Consistently over the last five years, and obviously longer before that, we've solidly lost a thousand rhinos plus annually. We should never underestimate the power that we sitting here have. Uh, in just sharing one small little thing and the snowball effect that that can create. If you look at our problem, you know, it's up to you and me and everyone around us to create a bit of a ripple effect to say, listen, it's proven that rhino horn doesn't have any effect on anything. So from our part, the way we try to add value to this uh, mission <coughs> is, to, is to train people. You know, we, we have a variety of courses in eco-training, training nature guides and trackers and conservation-minded people in these beautiful wilderness areas, firstly to understand the environment and then on how to um, sustain uh, ecotourism economies. And the basis of that is obviously valuing our natural assets. I think it's very important that we learn people why it is so important that we do something now. Everybody needs to be educated. I think we should never underestimate the value of, and I think you guys will know this, of, of education. The economy around tourism is a great mechanism for education. Being on a safari that's probably one of the most wonderful holidays you can have in anywhere in the world. So it shouldn't just be the domain of the privileged few. The benefits must spread to the communities around the parks. And that must be in all sorts of benefits that are fair and equitable. Education is one aspect, but also financial economic empowerment. You can't expect poor uh, people not to be tempted by the big bucks of poaching. Conservation is about people. Mm. And if conservation can become an inclusive thing, um, I think we'll make bigger strides, just from an upliftment point of view, just from a job creation point of view, from an you know, experience point of view. I think we can rely, uh, I believe, in the, the goodness in people. And uh, we've had the privilege of going to China a few times now, and I'm going in November again. You know, people are good and they're receptive. And eco-training's been privileged. I think we've trained about 450 Chinese people now. And uh, this conference I'm going to in November is in fact involving various Chinese government bureaus. They wouldn't invite you there if they didn't uh, value what well, the input. message, you know. Our mission for the last 24 years has been to reach people with an understanding and a connection of nature and to train professional guides. Guides go out into the industry and they can impart knowledge and enthusiasm and a sense of uh, responsibility for the, for the environment. Uh, you don't have to be an anti-poaching unit to remove snares from the bush. Mm. You know, we go on a great morning hike, you come across a snare, you can take it out. Yeah, That's cool. an animal save. If you look at the Makuleki concession, it's 1% of the Kruger National Park. It's got 75% of the biodiversity in the Kruger National Park. I feel very privileged to be able to work in an area like this. I think if you've got an opportunity to make a difference, then that's your responsibility. It's, you know, it's up to you, it's up to me, it's up to all of us to do your little bit and, you know, exactly. find like-minded people. Everybody's backyard, everybody's garden, everybody's business, everybody's school, everybody's family is responsible for their impact and their sphere yeah. of influence. And everybody in the world can actually just take the time to care about their patch. And, uh, you know, if eco-training and guys like Nkombi can you know, help people, enlighten people or encourage people, that's, that's our role. But everybody's got to get stuck in there. So what we need to do is educate people in rural communities and in fact from 
developed countries as well as to what the land can sustain. If we just had to move the, the goalposts from 1% of the world's global uh, tourism market to 2 or 3 or 5%, imagine five times more impact. tourists and impact. If this already supports Kruger and the surrounding areas and Cape Town and the Garden Reef, imagine five times that impact sure. through something that's perfectly sustainable. We should, positioning, we should be positioning South Africa as the world's leading ecotourism market. Grow it by, for example, five times and then you've got a massive impact for rural communities at a sustainable level. But in that growth, they need to be partners and they need to really enjoy the benefits.